Hi there, I'm Christine Lee with Torrance City Cable, and today I'm giving you a virtual tour of the Torrance Art Museum's Gallery One. Joining me is curator Josh Hashemzadeh. Thank Hi. you so much for being here. Thanks for, for having me. <laughs> so we're in a very unique situation because there is an exhibit in here that no one really can appreciate in person right now, right Josh? That's, that is true, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed for the end of August, but uh, right now this is the most in-depth look I think that we can, that we can have. So we thought we could bring the exhibit to you, and Josh and I are keeping our six feet distance, but you're gonna show me around to yep. each of these pieces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we'll go through and hopefully learn some more about the exhibition. All right, let's get started. Right behind us is the first one that you wanna show us, right? Yeah, so Roy Thurston. Uh, so this is an artist that was coming to prominence in like the late 70s and going through the, the 90s. And so he's using um, actually like metal works that he, he fabricates in his studio. And this piece specifically is using silicone that's going over that. And the way that that silicone is reflecting, uh, reflecting light um, really plays to how the like light of this this piece is, is displayed throughout the day. So Anna Sue Hoy, she's uh, another LA artist, but she's looking at materials here. Again, you can see like the concrete um, and the ceramic cast. It plays to a long history of ceramics within Los Angeles, but these minimalist forms are also in reference to East Coast-based sculptor Richard Serra, who had done a list, uh, like an essay that, that listed a bunch of verbs that talked about like how one approaches art making. And so for her, she's taking that and kind of thinking about, you know, the actions behind sculpture, right? So this like engagement of producing work as almost like a lifestyle engagement that informs the work and allows us to see these things uh, in more dynamic ways. And when I was looking at this over here, I started to get a little hungry because, <laughs> am I right? Is this frozen yogurt? So it is based on frozen yogurt. The piece is actually done in marble. And so this piece by Alex Israel is called The Big Chill, which takes its name from a very prominent frozen yogurt establishment in LA, The Big Chill. And then it also plays to the movie, the 80s movie as well, The Big Chill. And so it's kind of this play on history within LA and also this idea of fiction kind of permeating the ways we live our lives. And then you're going from colors to like <laughs> white again. What's this? So Lauren Halsey, she's working with, you know, again, really sort of basic industrial materials um, in order to tell like local stories that maybe otherwise wouldn't exist in like, the concept of a museum or an institutional history. So um, working in South Central Los Angeles, she's taking these, you know, um, almost like hieroglyphic as substrates, right, and like carving into them in the same way that you know, pictographs or, or things like that have conveyed stories for you know, thousands of years. So this is an artist that really is a master of illusion. So like all of these works, you know, they look absolutely real, uh, but when you start to look at them and you can kind of see on the back of that piece there, they are just canvases and they're, they're basic uh, materials that are meant to emulate these kind of industrial substrates. And so for him, like thinking about the relationship between Japan and America, having grown up and exposed to like Vietnam War, you know, he's really thinking about like the way illusions kind of exist within, within a cityscape and also like the idea of building something I think in LA, you know, that's so rooted in this kind of like development and, um, you know, sensationalism. Uh, that there's always this kind of like element of illusion to mm -hmm. that as well, right? There's always like hopefulness of what something could be and the reality of what it actually is. And so I think like finding him kind of in the middle of those two things uh -huh. in a way that feels almost like still life or, or representative, but then also kind of like formal and abstract, um, I think is, is an interesting play. And over here, am I seeing a bunch of ropes? They are. So Claudia Farducci, she's working with a uh, bronze cast uh, to create these ropes and so she's uh, also very invested in this kind of thinking of architecture, but sort of with like a feminist approach. You know, so rethinking the way that a lot of these kind of archetypes of environment have been created predominantly uh, from maybe like a male perspective yeah. and kind of turning them on their heads. So I always like looking at this piece almost like trophies, like, you know, like an old log cabin has those hunting trophies, you know, yeah. kind of up on the wall. You know, here she's posing the same thing, but in a way that's maybe alluding to, to a more malleable sense of what those things could be and, and how like interpretation on that can kind of remove its meaning or kind of play with that meaning. So Math Bath is an LA-based sculptor and painter, but I always like this piece because the bright colors mm -hmm. for one and the shape of, of this sculpture in itself 
kind of refers back to maybe some of the like local things that you would see. So maybe like when you see a, a storefront close, right? They pull that, that gate in front. I was gonna say it yeah, looks like kinda... the bars that you have outside windows or outside doors. Exactly, stand. exactly. Yeah. So it's like, it, it plays a little bit to that, but it also becomes this really kind of elegant and isolated form as well. And so kind of playing to how maybe someone interprets that, that imagery as something both maybe like banal, but then also beautiful. I think is an interesting contrast within this piece and, and something that also kind of plays to that mid-century uh, aesthetic that we talked about with Anna Sue Hoy and, and some of the other artists in the exhibition. So this is uh, that kind one of like totally different. polar opposite, right? So it's like th still very simplistic forms, but here kind of playing to a history of sculpture, like self-leaning, um, you know, so it's kind of a sculpture that's working for itself. And I always like the fact that to the, the silhouette of this kind of is reminiscent of, of overalls. Uh, you know, yeah. so kind of like thinking about labor and the idea of, of the history of sculpture as a sort of um, masculine endeavor and then thinking about how that can maybe be, you know, examined and, and deassembled and stuff. So thinking mm -hmm. about this as a sculpture in relationship to that, you know, you see how, how different these things are, but really like reducing things to their most iconic representation, right? How you can derive meaning from form in a very sort of basic and visceral way. So this is actually an interactive uh, piece by Juan Capistran. Um, and so you have the image of you know, a person laying on the ground, which you know, in today's climate is a very charged symbol, uh, but he's left it pretty ambiguous, right? You don't know if that person's you know, doing well, <laughs> if, they've, if they've just passed out, if they're just taking a moment to lay down. Um, but I think it's, it's really playing to like, our familiarity of these images and like, the meaning that we throw on to something. And so if you flip them over, um, there is a quote that says, Empire does not confront us like subject facing us, but that of an environment that is hostile to us. So thinking of really like how we're affected by the sort of systemic totality of everything around us um, and, and how we derive meaning from that and whether it's inflicted on ourselves or others, um, it's something that, that's really sort of uh, prominent now and I think has been for, for a long time. And so we really place that uh, as, a, as a local LA resident, um, you know, bring that history. So Helen Pashkin is a very prominent uh, LA artist that really rose to, to acclaim in the 1960s. So she's sort of a champion of the light and space movement, uh, along with many others that you may know, Mary Corse, James Terrell, Robert Irwin. And so she's really playing with like translucent materials. And she's one of the early people to do this and also really kind of set a paramount for, for female minimalists within Los Angeles. And so all of her pieces, you know, there's, there's kind of like this hidden element to it. And as you said, as you move around that piece, it kind of reveals things, you know, and, and the more time you spend with it or the more light is, is refracted mm -hmm. through the object, you start to find things kind of hidden within and, and you know, it creates this kind of abstract experience that um, is really dynamic to the way light plays with an object. And I think in California, there's no place better to play with uh, natural light than, right. than, you know, than here. So. So Aaron Sandness, uh, he is a, a younger painter as well. He's based here working with this piece with car enamel and, and paint. So this is actually based on uh, the manufacture of paint of a Pontiac. So thinking again of this kind of like local, almost like hot rod culture and this kind of Americana presence. Uh, and then you'll get these four triangles on, on each one of these X paintings uh, that create that, that dynamic sort of glossy X in the middle, and so those those shapes, although they look just kind of geometric, and they are, uh, they kind of reference, or they're meant to reference, um, you know, the folding of the American flag at, at ceremonies. And so he had lost a friend uh, in in the Iraq War, and so this is kind of paying tribute to that uh, in a way that says, you know, like we pay respect to that. But there's also this fascination of like you know, this Americana will to like just kind of keep going forward kind of like, you know, uh, pedal the metal kind of thing like within hot rod culture that is both enticing but also detrimental. And I think navigating um, why we lie somewhere in the middle of that is something that's interesting to him and something that these paintings continue to contemplate. And then we go from a bold color to a more kind of <laughs> Yeah, muted. so Lynn Aldrich, uh, she's working in LA for some time as well. Um, also really invested in you know, readily available materials. So you'll recognize that all these are rain gutters, you know, that you see on, on any suburban home. Um, but they're painted and, and, you know, dissected and cut and fabricated in ways that create a really kind of a, you know, organic shape. And this amalgamation of, of these materials, although kind of simple in their construction, 
one, start to develop a real complexity, and I think two, they kind of become a metaphor for LA's housing uh, development too in some ways, right? It's like this kind of organized and uniform development that kind of becomes chaotic in some ways, and in some ways kind of beautiful, but otherwise, you know, problematic. And so I think playing with that, uh, you know, these objects, which again are really simple, can start to have real meaning and tell stories about a place that's that's unique and, um, and different from you know, the way people may have approached sculpture on the East Coast and stuff at that time. So really kind of playing to a local, a local environment here. So these are rain gutters. They are rain gutters, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you, know, you, can, you can make art you know, with, with simple materials and, and, and generate, you know, I think, great meaning out of that. So this is a piece by Sam Durant. Um, so these are all taken off of um, like historical photos and documentation of protest posters. Um, so taking something that's really existing one in, in the streets and, and you know, engaged in a sort of civil rights discourse, um, he's presenting them as these you know, larger than life light boxes that you know, are reminiscent of the billboards and neon signs that you find on any boulevard um, or avenue here in, in LA. Um, but really thinking about how these ideas of protest, these, like, these messages of civil rights can kind of be reinterpreted um, over time and you know, how there's a kind of fluidity to one of the messages and then also uh, you know, the presence that they have. And even you know, the word, you know, you're an Indian land, like now today is maybe looked at differently than it was then. And, and you know, so the way that language changes, I think you know, he's advocating that civil rights kind of needs to make that kind of progression as well and that these things are always adapting. It's not, it's not a static environment. So Laddie John Dill, uh, this is a piece from the late 60s, and he's worked with Neon uh, early on to create almost like these sentences out of light. And for him, like creating this meaning either you know, vertically or horizontally, uh, out of these materials that again relate to that light and space movement, um, were really like pivotal to his practice and again helped shape the LA art scene in a way that was reflective of that environment. So all those neon signs that you see when you're you know, looking for for takeout and stuff, you know, you, you're so, uh, you know, exposed to them that they become synonymous in the way we think about, you know, how do you depict a city like Los Angeles or mm -hmm. city in general? And I think, you know, Larry John Bill using that as a, as a fine art object or material um, was really an interesting uh, approach at that time and still is relevant today. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for showing me yeah, around. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time.